Thank you as always for having me. My favorite scripture is a combination of two verses, Philippians 4.19 and Joshua 1.9. For my God shall supply all of my needs, for he will never leave me nor forsake me. Amen. Amen. Today we want to continue with our series that we've been on for a little while now, talking about a wilderness experience. And the, the character we're going to focus on today is going to be Moses. It's a, his experience, if you will, a wilderness experience that was led by another one and another one and another one. And you'll see in a moment uh, what I mean by that. Uh, another way of looking at it is a lifetime of difficulty that developed a firm faith in God's purpose for his life. Now, I don't know about you, but living the good life is something that I think we all have dreamed about at some point or another. We all have dreams of what we would do of the possibilities when the lottery hits half a billion dollars, right? Or maybe it's just me. You guys are like, oh, we're not supposed to do that in there. Yeah, sure. It's just me, I think. You see, when we're going through tough times or severe needs and wants, we might find ourselves wishing for the things that others have, for their resources, for, for the apparent comforts they have, for the apparent worry-free lifestyle that their wealth seems to bring them. You've heard us say, perhaps, that uh, money doesn't buy you happiness. But the reality is that you can buy a lot of things with money that can make you happy, right? So maybe the saying really should be, money cannot bring you joy. After all, happiness can be fleeting because it depends on the circumstances of that given moment. But joy can be an ever-present thing in spite of what we may be going through. So far, we've learned about Adam and how it is that he was able to find joy in God's redemptive love. We talked about Job a few months ago, and how he found joy in God's restoring grace. About a month ago, we talked about Joseph, if you remember, and he learned about joy in God's lifelong provisions. And now today, as we mentioned, we're going to look at Moses and how it is that he discovers joy that comes from trusting in God's promises even if it takes a lifetime to manifest. It's a beautiful thing how God works. I've been preparing for this message for about a month, and today you had everyone stand up and talk about God's promises. And it is what we're talking about today. As we will discover soon in Moses' wilderness experience, much like it was in the case of Joseph, God wanted to do something not only in his life, but he wanted to affect other people as a result. If you remember, through Joseph, God intended to save the beginnings of a nation, a mere 72 people. But now, through the struggles of Moses, God intends to save millions and fulfilled, in fact, a very old promise to make them their own nation. In his journey through a literal wilderness, Moses will grow from what we can call a pampered young rich prince to a man that learned to live under the goodness and provisions of God to finally one of the greatest leaders that human nature has ever known. Now, I'm not talking about the type of leader that our society these days talks about, but I'm truly talking about a servant leader, one who was willing to ultimately trust in God for direction and for purpose, but also a leader who was willing to stand between his people and God. What kind of people were this? Well, the Bible has very descriptive words for them. Stubborn, stiff-necked, disobeying, untrusting, wishy-washy, backward-looking, stubborn. Wait, I said that one again, but it's because they were doubly that. And an unwilling bunch of people. It doesn't sound like anybody worth saving, does it? And yet as unworthy as we may judge them to be from our perspective today, they remain the people chosen by God. A nation chosen to be a beacon of life, a standard of righteousness for all other nations around. A nation that was supposed to carry the name of God everywhere they went. Now in William Shakespeare, do we have any William Shakespeare fans in here? In William Shakespeare's famous Romeo and Juliet play, after the young lovers find out or discover that they belong to opposing feuding families, Juliet asks a very powerful question. She says, What's in a name? And then she says, a rose by any other name would still smell less sweet. You see, her point was that no matter what their family differences might have been, that their love should not be disrupted just because their heritage or because their names meant something that was in contradiction with one another. 
And yet names are important. In the Bible specifically, names carry great meaning. The name of Moses actually means drawn out. And we see that in Exodus 2.10. And if you remember the accounts and the story of Moses, his early life, you will see that this actually fits him perfectly. It's very descriptive. So what's in the name we could say? Moses' wilderness experience actually began before his life even took any shape. As a baby, he was caught up in Pharaoh's fears when he decided to thin out the population of the, the quickly multiplying Hebrew nation. And his mother, of course, uh, tries to hide him and she brings him down uh, into, uh, into the river. She hides him there. If you remember that part of the story, she puts him in a basket and then she leaves his sister Miriam to watch over the basket. Soon enough, the story tells us that Pharaoh's own daughter comes down to the river and she discovers the boy just sitting there in a basket. Clearly recognizing him as a Hebrew child, she seeks the assistance of a Hebrew woman under the suggestion of who? Of his sister who was standing around to nurture and care for the child. Now think about this for a second. Think about the goodness of God in Moses' life, how it relates to what we talked about a couple of weeks back in the life of Joseph, who was Moses' great, 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 a bunch of great uncles all the way back there. What Pharaoh had intended for evil, that is to kill all of the children, God will now use for good. So much so that after his own mother had to hide him in the waters, ultimately God returns the baby back to his mom, now under the protection and provision of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses is granted, you see, the opportunity to grow up within his culture, if you will. And when he was of sufficient age, the Bible tells us that he moved into the palace in Egypt to begin his life of luxury. And I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute, I thought we were going to talk about wilderness. Why is he going to live? Well, it can be tough too. You see, the best way for us to look at this is that God will always take time to prepare us. And he is certainly doing that in the life of Moses through education, through experiences that perhaps he might not have been able to acquire in any other place or any other way to prepare him for the challenges that would one day come his way. Some of you may know this, but my name Moy is actually a, a nickname short for Moises, which is Moses in Spanish. And while I can guarantee you that I am no Moses, I have often found comfort in my namesake when looking at my own wilderness experience. It is a name that has personally helped me to find courage in time of waiting, purpose in time of wondering, and faith in time of uncertainty. Now, I haven't always been successful at that, but the reality is that neither was the original Moy. You see, soon enough, after about 40 years, the young boy Moses is now a grown man who will again need God's help to draw him out of the situations he's going to get himself in. One day, the Bible tells us that Moses is just kind of walking around doing his thing, and he sees the suffering of his people. Remember, he, he was raised with them, so he knows this is his people. And he decided to take matters into his own life uh, and, and attack the soldier that was abusing one of the slaves. And he actually kills the soldier and hides him in the sand. And to make a long story short, Pharaoh is actually now seeking to kill Moses for his actions. And Moses has no other choice but to run away. As I thought about this part of the story, I, it came to my mind that I suppose this, this also reflects a little bit of my own journey. You see, I perceived some injustices in my life and I attempted, attempted to correct them. In fact, I picked a fight with a powerful bully and perhaps I wounded him, perhaps his pride. Maybe he felt threatened by, by an ignorant young servant and ultimately I too had to run away to a far away known place known as Florida. Well, the reality, maybe I'm in paradise already, I think. I do love Florida. Now we know through our scripture that God ultimately brings Moses to a Canaanite family under the leadership of a man named Jethro, who was a priest of Media, where Moses not only finds a wife and, and, and begins to have a family, but soon enough, unbeknownst to him, he begins and learns actually how to survive in desert conditions. How to depend on the daily favor of God and His provisions and how to sustain his life 
through God's gift as they are found in nature. What's in the name? We could ask again. You see, Moses' father-in-law is identified by two heretical names, a Canaanite and a Midianite. Midianites are believed to have been descendants of Abraham from one of his other wives after his first two children were born, which is Ishmael and Isaac. You may remember those two names. Isaac, of course, is one of the patriarchs in the direct line of the 12 tribes, of which one of them was Levi, of which Moses is a part of that tribe. You see, Jewish scholars believe also that these two terms, Midianite and Kenite, actually refer to the same people. In fact, Jewish historians trace it back all the way to Cain himself. And if you remember who Cain is, he was, he was Noah, um, Noah, Adam's, thank you, Major, Adam's uh, rebellious son. Here we see God's prevenient grace, if you will, at work. He is bringing Moses in this complete full circle. Even while in the wilderness, he connects him with these people who have actually already lived in the promised land. And who will one day come and join them. A distant family, they will one day travel with the Hebrew nation As they leave Egypt. A distant family who will eventually one day be absorbed into the line of Judah. You remember who the line of Judah is? Who comes from that? Jesus himself. Isn't it amazing how everything in the scriptures is connected with itself? And so ultimately after surviving in the desert for 40 years. Moses' time is finally ready. And now God calls him to put all of his wilderness experience, all of his training, all of his princely experiences into practice. You see, I've learned, my friends, in my journey that God does not waste our times of struggle, but he uses them always. God hears the cry of his people in Egypt and he sends Moses to set them free. Now... This would not be the simple task that I think we all grew up in Sunday school learning about. After all, if you remember, the reason that Moses escaped Egypt is because he had killed somebody. So returning to the city 40 years later was not going to be necessarily something they were just going to brush away and say, Oh, the standards of, of, of uh, what is it called? Of, uh, I'm, it's nice that you guys know that word. Yeah? It hadn't expired yet, right? It doesn't. But it wasn't an easy thing at all, was it? Somehow Moses was also supposed to convince a very powerful ruler to release an entire enslaved population for which undoubtedly was responsible for much of the wealth and prosperity and prestige that Egypt enjoyed. So it wasn't that just like, oh, I'm coming to get my people and they're going to go. It was truly an impossible task. Yes, a task that not a mere man could accomplish, but one that would require the persistent assistance and intervention of God. It actually reminded me of an account of the Apostle Peter later on with Jesus in the book of Matthew 19. When Peter highlights the impossibility of faithfully following Jesus, to which Jesus says what? With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You see, Moses had a a lengthy conversation with God next to a burning bush, if you remember that. And this was part of his complaints. I I, I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. Basically, God says, yes, it's impossible by yourself. But with my help, we will be successful. Through the faithful work of God and Moses' obedience, God ultimately gets Pharaoh to release the people, to let them go. And on the way to the promised land, they go, right? Well... Not so fast. If you recall the accounts of Moses' life, it was not an easy transition out of Egypt. God had to use ten plagues to finally convince Pharaoh to submit to his will. And even after the death of his firstborn, Pharaoh eventually pursues the Hebrew nation through the desert with the intent to return them to slavery. But thank God that God is not done with him yet. Not only has God rescued His people from their condition, not only did God get the Egyptian people to give the Hebrew nation gifts as they exited, in short, really, they were plundering the city. But now God will take care and destroy Pharaoh's army in one of the most famous biblical accounts in the parting of the Red Sea. 
or actually, more accurately translated, the reed seed. We're not talking about the major reeds, but you know, reeds that grow on the side of a water source, right? It's great that you have that name, you know. A joke would not have worked it otherwise. And yet, after all that they have witnessed, after all that they had experienced, how do you think this wonderful group of people respond to God? By whining and complaining, by being impatient and being stubborn. How dare them, right? Well, think about this. How many times have we begrudged God when we are not able to comprehend His complete plan? How often do we return to our old sin, to our own slavery, because we are unwilling to trust in God in the face of seemingly impossible situations? The truth is that we are not much different than the Hebrew nation, are we? In our discontent treatment of our good Heavenly Father, who while may permit difficulties to come our way, ultimately, as was quoted earlier, will work all things out for good if we remain faithful to Him. Now, you remember what happens next in the story? For three weeks, this nation of now estimated to be nearly two million people, when we count women and children, Walk through the desert, right up to the promised land. You say, why did it take them 40 years? You'll see in a second. Three weeks and they're there. They made it. They got there. But like we do sometimes in our lives, when they allow fear to enter into their heart, when they allow doubt to enter into their minds, this doubt took the form of, of, of mistrust in what God was trying to do. You see, friends, in our seasons of our certainty, we must be careful to guard our hearts against our own preconceived notions of whatever it is that's happening in front of us. How our happiness may be threatened. We must live according to God's promises and never stop believing that He will see us through any circumstance. You see, Moses in his capacity as a military leader, certainly a trait that I'm sure he learned while he was a prince in Egypt, decided to send some scouts into the land before simply walking in with two million backseat drivers with him. And so for 40 days, the spies, one spy from each of the 12 tribes, wanders around this new beautiful land. They're tasting the food, they're meeting the people, they're checking where the movie theaters are, all that kind of good stuff. Just seeing if you're listening. And when they return to Moses, the results, nah, they're not good. The people are giants. Their cities are heavily fortified. Their numbers are greater than ours. Proclaim, if you will, the more timid of the spies. But not our two rising stars. You see two of the spies, their names you may recognize, Caleb and and Joshua. Joshua, who would ultimately take over the leadership of the people, and Caleb, who was perhaps one of Joshua's most bravest commanders and responsible for the defeat of many of the people in the Promised Land. You see, 10 of the 12 tribes, they bought into their own fear story, and when they measured their own ability against it, they fell way short. But not Caleb, not Joshua. You see, they did not rely on their own abilities, but instead they decided to put their faith and their trust in God. However, as a result of the majority's unfaithfulness, Moses is about to enter not the promised land, but the third and final stage of his wilderness experience. You see, disbelief always brings real consequences. You don't believe me? What happens when we think that we can do anything without any consequences? Eventually we get caught and well, we have to pay a heavy fine. One of the easiest examples I can give you, we think we can drive around the highways as fast as we can time and time again. I never get caught until you get caught. And then you pay a heavy fine. The penalty for disbelief for the nation of Israel will ultimately be their own death. You see, God's anger burned with this unfaithful people to the point where He actually wanted to destroy everyone. But Moses, using yet another trait that I'm sure he picked up when he was in Egypt, he, he, he plays the role of an ambassador and he pleads with God for the people. You see, another name for a peacemaker, one who is willing to seek for alternate uh, solutions, is someone that we can call a servant leader. 
And Moses' intercession on behalf of the people makes him truly a wonderful precursor to Jesus himself. We can actually look at a simple comparison between Jesus and Moses real quick. Like Jesus, Moses was no ordinary child. We've covered that, right? The circumstances surrounding both of the birth of these two kids when they were first born was, uh, was appropriately extraordinary. Both of their lives were in danger when they were first born. Like Jesus, Moses was noted for having wisdom. Like Jesus, Moses had a season of preparation uh, as we're studying in this message this morning. You see, we don't know much about the first 30 years of each one of, these, of this person's lives. Yet we know that during that time, God was preparing them for what was coming ahead. Like Jesus, Moses showed righteous anger at sin. And yes, unlike Jesus, Moses did sin. And we'll cover that in a second. But yet even that God uses for his good and his purpose. Like Jesus, Moses was sent by God to rescue his people. But they did not recognize him as so when he first arrived. Like Jesus, Moses' aim was reconciliation with God. You see, he tried, says Acts 7.26, to reconcile the people back to God. Like Jesus, Moses is described as a ruler and as a judge. Like Jesus, Moses heard and answered to the voice of God. Like Jesus, Moses recognized that the holy place was not a specific religious location, but it was wherever God was present. In the same way that God is here, present with us today. Like Jesus, Moses sets the people free from their oppression. Like Jesus, Moses was misunderstood and rejected by his own people. Family, here's a simple recipe based on Moses' life, which I believe God wishes to bring into the life of every believer. You see, God's desire desire is to prepare us, to give us experience that will help us to accomplish His tasks, to develop in us a godly character. The world may call it a thicker skin, so that we can see His will through to the end. In Moses, as it is in our lives, it was a simple matter of time, right? Right? 40 years building a relationship with the would-be Pharaoh. We can call those organizational skills. 40 years learning to survive off the wilderness. We can call those leadership skills. And then 40 years putting it all into practice. We'll call those servant leadership skills. How does this all then translate into each of our journeys? You see, in the end, God calls us always to be obedient, whether we have to wait 40 years or four weeks. Here's God's honest truth. When we are obedient towards God, it means that we are agreeing in what God wants to do in each of our lives. And then as Isaiah 54, 17 says, when we do that, when we agree with God, then no weapon formed against us will be able to prosper. Did you cause your own spiritual wilderness experience? Because of poor choices. Choices that ultimately God has allowed in order to develop in you a greater character. Or is your journey strictly God ordained so that once and for all you can learn to trust, rely, and follow God's will. You see the Hebrew nation actually cried out when they allowed fear to dictate their future blessing. And proclaim their preferences to want to go back. They actually wanted to go back. They wanted to return to their lost condition for the sake of worldly desires. Something as simple as food. I think, in fact, they talk about onions. Go figure, they're good, but not that good. Yet Moses does not give up on them. And he continues to encourage the people. And he continues to proclaim the good uh, promises of God. In fact, our verse was shared this morning. Exodus 14.4. He says to the people, just don't worry about it. The Lord will fight for you. All you have to do is be still. Later on, God reminds us of the same thing in Psalm 46.10. When he says we have to learn to be still and know That he is God. Through Moses and the Hebrew nation. God was outlining the life that he wants us to live. A life that should make us different from the rest of the world. Indeed to set us apart as an example how we should live our lives. A name that he gives us that will have true meaning to those around us. The apostle Peter 
who had the advantage, of course, of living for three years next to Jesus, who was God himself, spells this out and outlines it in a very practical way. And in fact, it was the scripture that was read to us just a few minutes ago. And Peter says to us that God has given us all that we need for godly living. Did you know that? All that you need, he has given it. Peter says, through Christ our Savior, we have a precious promise to escape sin's cravings. We can truly put our faith in this. We should then, says Peter, add moral excellence to our faith. And to that add knowledge. To that add self-control, endurance, and affection for one another. These things, says Peter, will keep us from becoming inactive and unfruitful in our walk with God. Never forget, friends, that we have been cleansed from past sins, but we need to keep seeking that cleansing for our current sins. Or is it just me that continues to mess up? We need to, as the scriptures say, confirm our call and our election to be children of God and live always under those principles. So that ultimately, as the scripture says, we may receive and be welcomed into the eternity of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Living a life of obedience towards God will help us to identify His presence daily in all aspects of our lives as we become more familiar with Him. It is like when you buy a car and then all of a sudden everywhere you drive you see that same model of car. Has that ever happened to you? The truth of the matter is that all of a sudden there's not more of those cars. It's just that you have become so familiar with your model that now you recognize it everywhere. So in the same way, friends, we must become accustomed to God being present with us in every circumstance of our lives. So that no matter what we may be going through, we can always recognize His presence there with us. Moses proclaims in Exodus 15 too, The Lord is my strength and my defense. The psalmist declares in Psalm 39, 7, My hope is in Him. Just one last thing this morning. Moses' wilderness experience was clearly permitted by God to bless him, as we said, but also to bless the nation of the Hebrew nation as they fully began to develop into that. And so for 40 years, they wander in a big old circle, learning to trust in God's provision. The Bible tells us that God fed them, that He provided water for them whenever they needed. In fact, the scripture says that their clothes and their sandals did not wear out. That would be a good product for us to have here and sell it, right? I mean, we, because once people get tired of it, they donate it again, we can sell it again, right? You see, some of them are getting it. Moses did his job as the shepherd of his sheep, just like Jesus does for us. You see, a pastor's job is not to fix things, but it's simply to be a vessel that points people to the goodness and the love of God. But not just pastors. But really it is the call of every believer to be a beacon of hope for others. A source of love where the lost and depraved people of this world can come and find a way to the promised land of God. Never stop guarding your hearts. In the end, all of the abilities that God had given Moses go to his head. And actually Moses ends up taking credit for something that God had clearly done. Silly boy we could say. Like most believers, Moses self-confident led him to think that he could take it from here. You can almost hear Moses saying, I got this now, God, I know what I need to do. But we should never stop depending on God in our lives, ever. As a result, Moses is not permitted to enter the promised land when the time comes. And yet, while some may see this as a complete failure of his leadership, I actually like to see it as evidence of God's ongoing grace on his people. What do I mean by that? Well, God knew, and I'm sure Moses also understood, that occupying this new promised land was going to require a lengthy time of war. Something for which now our 120-year-old Moses might not have necessarily had the strength to endure through that. So. After showing him the promised land, the Bible says God took him up on a hill and showed him the promised land in the distance. God draws him out and takes him home with him. The Bible actually tells us that God buried his body. 
What an amazing example of what a close relationship with our Father in heaven, that relationship built on trust and belief and obedience can have in each of our lives. All the way to our very end. All the way right into His loving arms. How then are you allowing your own wilderness experience to be a blessing to others while it helps you to mature in your own faith? In what way can we use our life's experience to bless and to encourage others along the journey? If you can see time as God sees it, if you can see the end, if you can see that as a result of your obedience, you will one day ultimately be granted eternity into the arms of God, would you not begin to live your life right now? Of course we would. We can trust in God's promises because they are true. You see, the Christian faith is different than any other world religion because it is based on a personal witness of the goodness of God. Have you experienced such a goodness? You see, we can see it first through creation, including the characters that we've talked about. Adam, Job, Joseph, Moses, and to those that are still to come, they will share together. But even through you and me and what God does in our lives. So what will we do with that? What will we do with what God is doing in our lives? How He is developing each of us for something better, for a new thing. You see, it's great to give God thanks for places like this, for leaders, for people who love us and who guide us in the right direction. But let us never forget that it is God through His providential care that calls us and provides for our needs that develops us into a future full of hope and that grants us joy and calls us to join the team to go and save others as well. But perhaps you're not quite sure what you should do next. Well, you know, you can never go wrong with prayer. So I want to invite you to pray. These places of prayer are always available. I don't know why we have invitations. They should just be open. You can come and pray anytime. Come and seek the presence of God while He may be found. No more time to waste. No additional need for commitment. If you have been listening to God this morning, if He has been speaking directly into your heart, if He has been whispering for you to move in faith, if He has been making you uncomfortable about something, then you come and you pray. And ask God to complete the work that He has begun in each of our lives. Amen? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the astonishing way in which you work your purpose throughout history and through your prophets and through people like Moses. Lord, today I trust in your providence over all the events and circumstances of my life. Faithful Father, this life is full of more troubles and tribulations than, than I can think of at times. And, and when I get caught up in that, it tends to dominate my mind and distract me from your hope. Father, when I feel enslaved in my own anxieties, I get defensive, I get hostile, especially towards you. So I ask that you would forgive me and grant me a bigger picture perspective in what it is that you are doing in my life and through my life. Lord, grant that I may turn my eyes to heaven to see you and to be confident of your faithfulness so that as I learn to stand still, anticipating your perfect will, that your powerful joy will come once again and help me to be of service to you as I serve others. Lord, you know each of our lives. You know our needs, our desires. You know our transformation process. May we take an active part in what you're doing in us, rather than just being bystanders. Bless this place, I pray, for the kingdom work that takes place here. Bless his leaders and his staff, and may they gather their strength and joy directly from you as they seek to inspire others. Bless the men and women currently completing this program, not just because they want to be better people, but most importantly, because they are seeking a closer relationship with the only true high power. Father, may we be ever so mindful of your hand working through every stage and aspect of our lives. And may we ever be so willing to move forward in faith. 
And so straight from Psalm 121, I raise my eyes towards the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Family, hear his promises as you travel through your own wilderness experience. The word of God says that God will not let your foot slip. Your protector will not fall asleep on the job. No, he never sleeps or rests. The Lord is your protector. The Lord is your shade right beside you. The sun will not strike you. The moon will not strike you. The Lord will protect you from all evil. God will protect you on your way. The Lord, says the word of God, will protect us in our journey whether coming or going, from now until forevermore. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.